Hello and welcome to this week's Securacy webinar. My name is Russell Redzikovsky and I'm the Customer Success Manager at Securacy. In last week's webinar, we covered how to back up your data and best practices on backups. This week, we're going to cover email security. In order to prevent possible cybersecurity incidents that could affect your company email, you need to understand the best practices when it comes to email security. Email is one tool that almost all organizations use on a daily basis. However, many don't overly consider it when it comes to security. They believe that the service they use provides good enough security. However, this is not the case in today's ever-changing security landscape. Attacks have changed, directed social engineering and email phishing attacks, as well as email spoofing have taken off exponentially, and if you do not examine your security around these attacks, it could lead to an incident. These attacks mainly focus on your employees and your staff as they are more psychological and less uh, so involving hacking or technical attacks. These attacks are specifically targeted on certain firms or certain individuals, usually executives in companies, and aim to steal information, data, or money from these organizations. In order to understand and prevent these attacks, you and your staff need to understand the best practices on email security. Following the webinar, we'll take a few minutes to answer any questions that you may have. So let's get started. On today's agenda, we're going to review the following topics. Policy, passwords, two-factor authentication, unexpected attachments, company email for business purposes only, avoid public Wi-Fi or use a VPN, spam filters, never click unsubscribe in a spam email, and phishing. Policy. Policy is one of the first lines of defense when it comes to cybersecurity and creates the basis of your email security. In order for your company to protect itself, it must have a documented set of procedures to outline what you and your staff need to do when it comes to their company email. Three major policies that influence email security are email, acceptable use, and password policies. These three policies should be communicated and followed by all staff members. The content of the policy should outline the need for the policy, who has to follow it, procedure to follow the policy, and what happens if it is not followed. For example, your email policy should outline your company's guidelines on email usage, measures to prevent unauthorized access, and what to do if an issue occurs. Acceptable use should outline what is and is not accepted by your company when it comes to technology, software, especially email. And then finally, your password policy should outline what requirements you have for each account's password. This includes your email password. Um, it should have and should cover such things as the complexity requirements, two-factor authentication, and any other standards set by your company. Having a policy for each of these items is great, but each staff member needs to be required to read and understand that policy. Having a training session on the policy's content would help enforce the policy and can help provide your staff with a better understanding of how and why these policies are implemented and how it affects their email. Passwords. Having a strong password is one of the most basic requirements of email security. A weak password is never going to protect your email and your company's data that is contained in those emails. We are going to cover best practices on passwords and authentication next week, but I can offer some quick basic tips today. A strong password should always contain the following, upper and lowercase letters, numbers, and special characters. You should avoid words that are commonly found in a dictionary, um, and it should never include the following as well. Uh, anything that can be personally identified uh, based on you, um, so that includes your phone number or date of birth, anniversaries, children's or pets' names, or your home address. Um, as well, if you can avoid common letter number substitutions, that is a best practice. Um, you should as well think in terms of phrases. There is popular opinion out there now that actually a passphrase is more secure than a password. Um, and depending on requirements, you should update your passwords on a regular schedule. Two-factor authentication. While this might sound very technical or something that it would be difficult to implement, it is becoming much more common now and is actually pretty simple to implement 
in your organization. Two-factor authentication uses something you have and something you know. While you know your password, two-factor authentication gives you something to have, something more physical, and it is input along with your password. This creates an, another layer of security. So usually two-factor authentication is tied to a cell phone or an application like Google Authenticator. After signing in with your username and password, you'll be prompted for two-factor authentication. Depending on the service and how it is set up, um, sometimes you will get a text message with a code in it. An app will be displayed on your phone and you will click to accept, or uh, you will go into another app and you will copy a code and then input that code into your email program that you're logging into. Uh, this is a great feature and definitely augments your security. If a cyber criminal does crack or guess your password, they now need access to another device or another application, which usually they do not have access to. Two-factor authentication should never be set up to send these messages or codes to your computer. If your device was stolen, the hacker now has not only your device, but also what is going to be receiving that two-factor authentication message. Never open unexpected attachments. Email attachments are a normal part of most businesses' day-to-day -day operations. When you receive an email with an attachment, you should take a moment and review the email. This is best practice for emails without attachments as well. Verify the email, verify who it was sent from, do not trust the display name, this can be spoofed. Look at the actual email address itself. If the email is from your manager, coworker, customers, or clients that commonly send attachments, it's okay to be a little less skeptical of this email, but you should also practice some best practice that we'll cover in a moment. By default, many email applications have virus scanning capability and can be set to filter common spam from known offenders. Um, review these settings with your email client. Um, or you have IT review them for you. All emails you receive may not be from known senders. What should you do if you get an email from someone you do not know? Um, it's, most of these apply to if you do know the person as well, it's just general best practices. Uh, review all details of that email, try to verify that it is legitimate. Look out for requests for information in that email. Uh, attachments that are not documents, nobody should be sending you an EXE file, so make sure your email program is set up to display file names. Um, any misspelled words or language mistakes? Some email providers like Google will warn you of potential issues with attachments, but they can't delete them from that email. Any suspicious email and their attachments should be deleted right away. The incident should be reported as these attacks usually do not occur to just one person, they'll occur to many members of your company. You should not send these emails to IT or your manager as they could open them by mistake. Instead, you should document that email content or take a picture of it. Having an antivirus or anti soft anti-malware software on your computer is vital as well. If you do by accidentally click one of these attachments, having a program there to scan your computer and see if there was any malicious software installed is a great security tip. Company email only for business purposes. Your company must have a policy when it comes to email and acceptable use. It should outline that your employees or what your employees can and cannot do with their company email. The most important point being that the company email should only be used for business purposes. Attackers will use any way they can to gain access to your system. Restricting email usage to only business activities reduces the amount of area where your email could be exposed on the internet. If your employees are online shopping, signing up for mailing lists, and emailing personal friends with their company email, it has opened up the email to more exposure as it is now in more places. If that online shopping platform or mailing list was to suffer a data breach, your company email is now in the hands of an attacker. They could then use this to try to gain information from your company, or, or, and that opens you up to possible phishing attacks. The best way to achieve the goal of only having company email for business practices is to have a policy on this and kind of create an end-to-end -end security. So explain to your employees why it's important that they should only use company email for business purposes. Make sure they have a documented policy on this that they can review, read and review. And then finally, train them on what to do as well when it comes to email. So train them to only use it for business purposes. This includes everybody as well. It should be restricted from your newest employee to your CEO. No one should be using company email for 
personal reasons. Um, if everybody is following this policy, it makes it much more easier to implement. If your founders and CEO aren't using uh, your company email, it's a great example for the rest of your staff members. So consider company-wide training to explain the usage of email for business purposes only, and it will ensure that the re it will help to explain the reasoning to your staff members and also imp improves their basic understanding of cybersecurity. Avoid public Wi-Fi or use a VPN. Do you have any remote workers or staff that likes to sit and work in a local coffee shop or restaurant? Are they using the shared Wi-Fi in these locations while they work? Are they opening and sending emails over this public connection? If they are using this, it could be potentially exploited by someone sitting in that coffee shop or using the same connection. An attacker could be sniffing all the data that is going across that open Wi-Fi connection, including emails with company data. Training your staff to be very cautious when it comes to public Wi-Fi or requiring them, if they have to use public Wi-Fi, to use a VPN is a great and it is essential for security. Not only do VPNs encrypt the data, um, allowing you to work safely and securely on a public connection, but the data um, is encrypted from end to end, offering you improved security and keeping your company data private. VPNs are not very difficult to implement. Depending on your organization, you can purchase a VPN service um, that will provide you essentially an end-to-end an, an -end encryption for your data over a public network, or you can have your IT department set up their own VPN depending on your network structure. Educating your employees on the weakness of public Wi-Fi and how to use a VPN can reduce the chances of your data being viewed or stolen when on a public Wi-Fi connection. Spam filters. Using a cloud service for email like Google or Office 365 allows you to take advantage of their built-in anti-spam filters. Google and Microsoft catch a large amount of spam before it ever gets to you, and this database is constantly updated by no, of uh, known spammers. Ensure that your spam filter is on. If you're using a cloud provider, make sure that your filters are turned on and the settings are configured to your needs. If you host your own email or use a small provider, make sure that what you're using has filters. And if it doesn't, look out for a software solution that does provide a spam filter for you. Um, using filters will reduce the amount of phishing attacks and unwanted emails you could receive. However, these filters are not perfect. Any spam that does get through should be marked as spam and removed from your inbox. This will ensure that any additional spam from these centers is blocked and removes the chance of this email sitting in your inbox for you to click later accidentally. Review your email or review your filter settings in your email. So most providers will give you the ability to filter email based on specific words or phrases and have their own built-in filters. This can be useful uh, when GNOME scams are happening at the moment, as you can change these on your own. These filters should be reviewed on at least an annual basis to ensure that they are meeting the security needs of your organization and are staying up to date with the latest security threats. Never click the unsubscribe link in spam emails. Do not select the option to unsubscribe from a spam email. If it makes it into your, or if it makes it past your spam filters and into your inbox, you should mark the spam and delete it. Many phishing or malicious emails will contain an option to unsubscribe that was placed there by the attacker. This is an attempt to fool you and actually provides them with information about you. Clicking the link lets them know that they have made it through to an actual person. Many times this link you select is redirecting you to a malicious site that will ask you for your email or name to unsubscribe. This is the attacker attempting to steal information from you by appearing to help you get rid of these emails. Again, if a spam email gets through your filters, mark it as spam and delete it. Next time it'll be copy or spam filters, but never click that unsubscribe link in a spam email. Learn how to recognize phishing. Phishing attacks are one of the most common forms of social engineering and primarily use email or malicious websites to solicit personal information by posing as a trustworthy organization. An example of phishing would be an attacker sending an email that appears to be sent from a reputable company or financial institution that requests account information. Oftentimes, this suggests that there was a problem. Um, you're, they'll require you to make a payment or that you owe money. When a user replies to that email with the request information, attackers can then gain access to your accounts. 
Phishing attacks usually take advantage of current events in particular times of the year, such as natural disasters, epidemics and health scare, uh, particular economic concerns such as tax season, IRS and CRA scams are very common nowadays, um, political elections and holidays. They focus on these times of the year as people are less focused or are looking to help those in need. Um, if you get an email from the CRA or IRS, be very suspicious about it, um, especially if it's during tax time as this could be a sign of phishing. Thanks for joining us this week. We can now review any questions you may have while we wait for the questions to come in. Uh, next week's webinar will cover the topic of password and authentication best practices. Now let's review your questions. What should I do if I get a suspicious email? What you should do if you get a suspicious email is stop. Take a moment and review that email. Ensure that it is suspicious or if it is legitimate. Don't click anything, take a look around. Verify that the display name, who it's being sent from, matches the email address. Look for spelling or grammatical issues. Look for any requests for information or urgent email subject lines. Um, check any links. If they send you a link, make sure that link uses HTTPS and um, be kind of a little wary uh, by clicking it. Try to verify that email independently. What information should I never give out about my email? Well, you should never give anything out personal. Uh, never give out your password to your email. Um, be wary about giving your email out to others, especially if it is a company email. It should only be used for company purposes. Don't sign up for mailing lists. Don't give it to people. Don't give it to anybody who could use it for malicious purposes. And looks like that's it for questions. I wanted to thank you again today. Uh, next week's webinar will be covering the topic of password and authentication best practices.